of my heart Be the wind inside my sails The anchor in the waste Oh, he's my song Jesus, you're my song Let the king of my heart Be the fire inside my veins The echo of my days Oh, you're my song my song, you are good, good, oh yeah, you are good, good, oh yeah, you are good, oh yeah, you are good, you are good, you are good. You are good. Suddenly 
Pleasure to introduce Nelson Schumann. Almost a German name. Do you want to just hold it or do you want to? No, I just put it up here. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, it is almost a German name because I've been told that it is German, so. <laughs> How do I get this to go? Oh, okay. Well, um, I am enjoying the snow because I've been in uh, Texas for like uh, ever for, for the winter and came back a few weeks ago and I have I have missed the snow okay. I have missed the snow because when I grew up in Indiana I enjoyed snow because snow got me out of school so who here remembers the blizzard of 78 did you guys have any blizzard up here during 78? Because I know that we did in, in Indiana. And uh, it was awesome because we got out of school for two weeks. We didn't have to make up one day. It was like heaven. So that's why every time I see snow, it reminds me of enjoying my uh, childhood. And, uh, and I did. I had a good childhood when I grew up. Um, and a lot of us didn't. A lot of us had a mother or a father that didn't love us the way that they should. And even though I felt very much loved by my mom and my dad, um, I still inherited some uh, of these spirits we're talking about tonight. And you may think, well, how is that possible? You know, you grew up in a Christian home. You were loved by your mom and by your dad. Like, well, um, because things happen. You know, they, we don't live in a perfect world. And, and the enemy is out there seeking who he can devour. And he comes after those, of course, that are coming to church because he wants to hurt us and, and cause us to hurt other people. So what better way of doing it than to hurt you know, God's people that he created and then have them come into the church and then say things to hurt other people that have already been hurt. You know, We don't wanna do that. We wanna become more like Christ and less like you know, the enemy. And so therefore we should have more fruit in our lives, fruit such as you know, love and joy and peace. We should get along with our spouse. We shouldn't be striving and fighting and arguing. What would start, you know, start us to fighting and arguing with a spouse? Well, the enemy wants that, of course. The enemy is real. You know, it says um, in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, let me turn this up on here. There we go. So 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 3 through 6, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So there's a lot of strongholds that we struggle with, you know, as we grow up from childhood to adulthood. And uh, we hear familiar thoughts that come into us. Not all those thoughts are from us. A lot of those thoughts are coming from the enemy. And just because you say, Jesus, I want you to come live in my heart, doesn't mean that all those thoughts from the enemy stop. You know, our souls, which are our mind, will, and emotion, get hurt as we're growing up. 
So those thoughts can continue on and sometimes even get worse from the enemy. And if you can't discern between the enemy's thoughts and your own, if you think of a lot of the thoughts that are coming from the enemy or yourselves, then you're not gonna be at peace. You're not gonna get along with your spouse. You're not gonna get along with your children or people at work or people at school or people in general. So it says we're supposed to cast down arguments. So anyone ever have any arguments with any other human beings on earth? Yeah. You know, is that of the Lord? You know, a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle in all their ways. 2 Timothy 2, 23, 24. Why would a Christian strive? Why would they argue? Why would they fight? Well, because they're hearing some thoughts up here from the enemy that's causing them to say things that they shouldn't be saying to other people. Um, so we're supposed to cast down arguments and every high thing, every prideful thing. Anyone ever met anyone that's prideful? I'm gonna describe what pride looks like. Most all of us have pride. And that's the challenge is how do we identify that? How do we humble ourselves enough to see the pride? Because pride can kick you out of heaven like it did Lucifer. And we don't want that obviously. We want all the pride gone as much as we possibly can um, in our lives. And then we become more Christ-like. People draw to us because they can feel the love is genuine. Um, so it says, cast down arguments and every high thing, every prideful thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. Ah, oh, there it is, every thought into captivity. So it doesn't say that, okay, if you go to church, you don't have to bring your thoughts into captivity. No, he's writing basically here to those that are gonna be Christ followers, Christians. So we're supposed to take every thought and bring it into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So what does that look like? How many of us think about our thoughts every day that we live? I never did. I used to think all my thoughts were my own. You know, I think a lot of us were probably brought up saying, well, Christians can't be affected by demons. You know, and maybe some of them are saying, well, Christians can't be possessed by demons. You know, then the question is, okay, what does oppressed and oppressed mean? You know, can we hear demons? What do demons sound like? You know, demons sound like our own thoughts, you know, except they're going to be causing us, if we buy into what they say, to be hurt by them. We're going to be you know, uh, taking an offense, we're going to offend people, we're gonna be jealous, we're gonna be angry, we're gonna be prideful, we're gonna be controlling of other people. You know, we're not gonna be at peace and love and joy the way that, that Christ wants us to be if we're hearing from the enemy. So, um, the Lord had me go through some things in my life. Um, grew up in Indiana, grew up on a farm, was in 4-H, was in FFA, um, became the class president my senior year of high school. Then I went on to Purdue University and uh, got a sales and marketing degree, got married right out of um, college and had three children, two boys and a girl, and uh, had, had some, started having some uh, challenges with my older son. And uh, we didn't know what to do. We ended up putting him in counseling and uh, we spent thousands of dollars and nothing worked. Uh, he was very defiant, wouldn't listen. I was very disrespectful. And uh, it was like nothing worked. And I was very frustrated every time he'd come home from the school bus strife would start, fighting would start. You know, we put him in church, of course, we were always going to church and him, he was baptized. And so uh, the behavior was not lining up with what a true Christian should be, but it was part of my experience, part of my journey to learn about what these demonic spirits could do to a person if the persons are hearing them. You know, and, and again, I was growing up in a church um, where I didn't ever hear any messages from people from the pastors saying that Christians could be affected by demons. So. All I saw was behavior that was really, really bad. And I was like, how do I fix this, God? You know, I'd, I'd, at the time I worked for a company that was based out of St. Cloud, Minnesota called Banker Systems. And I used to sell software to banks in Indiana, Illinois, and Kentucky. And um, I remember, you know, talking to bank presidents and loan software and new account software, and then coming home and having strife all over my house. And I couldn't stop, I couldn't control it. You know, and spanking didn't work. <laughs> it was like, how do we get this kid that's out of control into control? Because medication they were telling him to take didn't work. I couldn't get to the root issue. I'm like, well, I'm gonna fix this problem because uh, that's who I was. I wanna fix issues. So ultimately it caused a lot of strife and my wife and I, we ended up going through a divorce that I didn't wanna go through. And I was devastated after 17 years. And I was like, my gosh, Lord, this is not what I wanted out of my life. And he said, well, what is it that you want out of your life? And I'm like, well, I thought it was, if I had money, I wouldn't have any problems because we grew up and I was poor on the farm. And uh, there's a lot of things we couldn't buy. And I'm like, if you had money, then you wouldn't have problems. But that wasn't the case. I had a lot of money, but I didn't have peace. So I'm like, what I really want, Lord, is peace. And he said, this is what I'll do for you. 
I will take away all the money you had at the time. It was about a half million dollars. He goes, I'm going to take it all away, and I'm going to change you, change your heart in the process. And then I'm going to, once I've got that done, bring the money back way greater, but I'll have your heart now, and you'll serve me out of that heart, and you'll serve me with the increase in finances for kingdom purposes and not just for your own selfish purposes. So I agreed to that thinking there's no way I'm going to lose a half million dollars, but went through a divorce that took about 60% of it. And then um, the Lord brought me a new wife to get married to. And um, I started hearing from the Lord for the first time. This is back in late 2008. And he was speaking to me and I could hear him. And uh, he said, now it's time to look for your next wife. And everybody can like mute your phones so we don't get distracted, that'd be great. Um, in fact, I'm gonna make sure my phone's muted. <laughs> It'll go off. Uh, so ultimately, um, I met another uh, woman that became my wife and she had a lot of pains when she grew up, um, father wounds, mother wounds and so forth. And it cost her several marriages, three marriages before me. And when I met her, the Lord was all over this. He said, you know, this is a woman that I'm bringing to you that you're gonna love her like Christ, love the church. I went to a big conference, had a bunch of prophetic people saying, you're gonna have a worldwide ministry working with people who have been hurt deeply, you know, people that have had challenges in their relationships, challenges in marriages and divorces and children that have been hurt. You're gonna deal with a lot of messy situations, but you're gonna have a very strong anointing and you're gonna help them get set free. And, uh, and a lot of these prophecies involved being able to prophesy over people, which I wanted to do. All I could do was pray in tongues and um, also dealing with healings, which I didn't know anything about, and then deliverance, which the only thing I knew about deliverance was my grandmother did it and she was really weird. And I'm like, I am never going to do deliverance because, man, I'm not going to be weird. I want to be normal. I want to be like Jesus. You know, Jesus would be able to talk to people and they'd draw to him. He wasn't weird. So, um, so anyway, we got married. And then after we got married, I saw a different side of her that was really mean, wasn't nice. And then the Lord spoke to me that night on our wedding night. And he said, yes, he goes, I told you you were going to love her like Christ loved the church. But the part, second part of that is that you're going to lay your life down for her. You're gonna take a lot of stuff that you don't wanna take, but you're gonna love her like Christ loved the church. And she's gonna hurt you out of the pain that she had when she grew up. And there's a lot of pain there. And you're gonna take it, you're not gonna tell anybody about it. You can't tell anybody about it um, until I release you from that. And so um, I was kinda of like, well, not real happy. I'm like, why did you have me marry her to go through a bunch of a pain? I'm like, that doesn't sound fun. I'm like, I wouldn't have done that if I would have known that that was gonna be involved. He said, well, just trust me. It will be worth it in the end. Because in the end, you'll help like millions of people around the world. So I'm like, all right, how, can, how bad can it be? She's a woman, you know, I'm a guy. So, so then I agreed to be, stay married. And then um, ultimately the Lord showed me from his perspective why she was going to hurt me, how she was hurt through father wounds and mother wounds because they were hurt. Her father didn't know um, his father, his biological father. So he was like an orphan and uh, he had a stepfather that treated him well, but nonetheless, he didn't know who his biological father was. And for a large part of his life, he had to live as an orphan. And then um, her mother had a, mo a monster, they called him for a father that was very abusive. And one of their sons died and, and one of the daughters he was trying to put into a car and kill. And uh, so he was hurt though by his father. So I saw all that really that first night so that I could love her and take a lot of what turned out to be verbal abuse and physical abuse and even some sexual abuse. And, and I, was, I, I was corrected as far as what I thought about, you know, her being a girl and me being a guy, that it wouldn't be that hard, but it was extremely hard because when you get yelled at a lot, when you get verbally berated and it goes on for hours, and then you get knives thrown at you, you get glasses thrown at you, you get chased around the house and the hotel rooms, you get your you know, fingernails of your wife, you know, scarring your arms and being crazy. It's like, but yet yeah, she could be super nice and normal in front of the church. We go into the church, she could prophesy, she could pray in tongues. Everybody thought she was great. And I'm thinking, why is she behaving this way in church? And then she's completely opposite when she's around me. If she's around human beings, she was nice, but when she was around just me, she would be awful. And eventually, um, we were mentored from a, a, a guy from California. It was basically teaching us some things um, spiritually that I did not know, such as taking authority. I'd never heard about taking authority like Christ did. Of course, it says in the Bible, we're supposed to do the same things as Christ and even greater. So 
I didn't know how that was done. So he taught me in about 15 minutes one time about taking authority. And so I prayed over my son. He said, your son wants to be set free. And I'm like, no, he doesn't. He likes to be mean. <laughs> Go, he's done that for 10 years. He's like, no, that's the demonic spirits he's hearing up here in his thoughts. And they're basically telling him what to do. And therefore he's doing them because he's hearing those so loudly. And he goes, you just need to take authority in Jesus' name and command the spirits to go. He goes, they have to respect you because you are his father. He's only 18 years of age. He's living in your house. You have the spiritual authority. I had never been told that from anyone in my entire life. And so I'm like, okay, I'm willing to try this because nothing's worked. You know, none of the counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, medication, it's all failed me. So I'll try it. So that next day I asked him if I could pray for him and he said yes. And I was shocked. And so I just said, okay, here goes. And I said, I command every spirit not of the Lord to be gone in Jesus' name. And I speak peace over your mind. And then I looked very closely to see if I could see demons flying out. And I couldn't. And I'm looking really closely in, you know, in the car. I'm like, where are they at? You know, did it work? I'm like, I don't know. You know, so the next day I go out to mow the grass, which is something he hadn't done for a couple of years, never willingly did it. And he comes walking out of the house and it says, hey dad, can I finish mowing the grass for you? And anyone see like Leave It to Beaver? It kind of reminded me of Eddie Haskell. Like, hi, Mr. Cleaver. And I'm like, who are you? You know, I didn't say that to him. I was trying to play cool, but I was in shock. So I'm like, this is not my son. My son would never be sweet and nice and then ask me to mow the grass. And then he said, also, I want to go get a haircut and apply for a job at Burger King. And I'm like, what? So I gave him the mower. I backed away slowly. I go into the house. I fall to my knees. I start crying. And I'm like, God, what happened? He goes, that is your son, who he really is. You got your son back today. And I'm like, you're kidding. It was that easy. Why didn't you tell me that 10 years ago? You would have saved myself a lot of hell. He said, because you had to go through that hell. That's part of your ministry. If you don't go through the hell, you will not have an authority over that. That's why many of you have gone through hell in your life. Because there's an anointing on you to help people go through and get healed from what you walked through. And if you never walked through it, then you would never be able to do it. You think about it. How many people are out there that are trying to help people in marriages that have maybe never experienced a person that has experienced what, my, what I've experienced? And so therefore, how can they speak? How can they just, because a lot of times they'll say, just love them better, just love them better, respect them better. And I'm like, what? You do that, you try that. It didn't work. I loved, like Christ loved the church and I was abused for six years and it didn't get better, it got worse. And, go on, and then eventually what happened is my wife would tell me that she could hear the enemy telling her bad things about me in her head. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not in your head. I don't hear what you're hearing. I'm not hearing that. All I'm hearing is I should like divorce you and leave you because you're being awful to me. And yet I'm not going to because I know that God told me and I'm going to stay in this until whatever time the Lord says, do something else, but I'm standing for that. So ultimately I went through it for six years. It was awful, it was horrible. Um, and I kept waiting for her to get better. And finally the Lord said, you, um, she was trying to stop me from doing ministry at the time. And the Lord said, you need to now separate from her. And I'm like, no, I don't want to separate. I went through all this hell. I don't want to go through this for nothing. I'm like, I love her. I want her to get delivered. And he's like, yeah, well, he goes, the spirits in her hate you. I'm like, I know that. <laughs> Tell me something I don't know. He goes, and they want to kill you. I'm like, well, I, yeah, I've seen, I've had knives thrown at me. That's not real cool. And glasses. And so I'm like, just get her delivered from whatever she has. And he said, no, you know, she's got a free will. And uh, this is how it's going to go down. He said, you're going to separate and then you're going to start to set up the ministry and it's going to grow rapidly around the world. It'll be a controlled rollout because you couldn't handle it if everybody knew what you knew because <laughs> you couldn't. And so I'm like, no, nah, that's not going to happen. He's like, yeah, it will watch. And so I end up separating January 23rd, 2015, still loving her, still wanting her to get delivered. And she refused um, the Lord finally, two weeks after I separated, told me what she had, said that she had a spirit of Jezebel and a spirit of Leviathan. And I'm like, okay, I've heard of Jezebel. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> I go, but what the heck is a Leviathan? I've never heard that word before. <laughs> and he said, look it up. It's like in six verses in the Bible, Job 41 talks all about Leviathan. And I'm like, Job 41. So I remember flipping through it. And I'm like, okay, I remember Job 42 when all these great things come back to Job. I don't remember anybody ever preaching ever on Job 41, which it describes this Leviathan 
creature that's living in the water that has scales that are its pride, that are like impossible to kill. And uh, I especially remembered reading the last two verses. It says, on earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing, which is every prideful thing. He is king over all the children of pride. I'm like, ah, oh, yes, I sense a lot of pride on my wife and her whole family. Lots of pride, extreme pride. And I was like, huh, that makes sense. And then Jezebel, I started researching, reading books by John Paul Jackson, uh, watching videos by uh, Robert Morris from Gateway Church in Dallas. And everything I was reading was like describing her to a T. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I can help her get set free now. Praise the Lord. So I remember putting together an email, sending it to her, copying her best friend and saying, honey, this is exactly what you got. We finally have a solution. Yes, I was so happy. But she was less than thrilled. In fact, she basically dispelled it and said, no, you know, she was already lying about me and she wasn't being honest. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be harder than I thought. And of course, all the books I was reading is like, it's almost impossible to get people set free from those spirits. It's so hard, you know, you have to get them into a room and they're gonna lie their way out of everything and they're gonna act like they're apologetic and repentive and then they're gonna lie about that and when they go home, they're gonna be twice as mad at you and I'm like, well, what the heck? So then I'm like, Lord, I go, this is really gonna be a lot harder than I thought. I go, how, because the books I was reading describe the behavior. I go, how does a person get this? And then how do they get delivered from it? That's what I wanna know because if I'm gonna help people around the world, I need to know this and I teach them this, so. And I didn't see any of the books that said this. So he told me, he goes, how you get the spirits is through wounds from your father, your mother, your stepfather, your stepmother, through sexual violations that happen to you, through traumas. He goes, and as you grow up, then the enemy will speak to you and remind you about those traumas and the injustices and all the pain so that you start to have bitterness and anger towards the people that hurt you. I'm like, well, that makes sense. Yeah, why wouldn't you get angry? He said, yeah, the only problem is they can't get delivered as long as they stay angry and bitter at those people. And the enemy's job is to keep reminding them over and over again about those traumas, about what their father did, their mother did, their stepfather, their stepmother, maybe about not being protected Maybe about they were touched inappropriately. Maybe they were shown a Playboy. Maybe they went on the internet and saw sexual things. I mean, it's hard not to see sexual things that are inappropriate these days because it's everywhere, you know? And so after explaining that, okay, through traumas and all this bad things, then we start to hear the voice of the enemy. Well, that made sense to me. I'm like, yeah, the enemy's gonna remind you. Yeah, remember how bad your dad was? How bad your mom was? How bad this was, that was? And you could have been hurt when you were like a little girl, little boy, when you were like six months old or a year old, you could have been touched inappropriately. But you tend to start getting hurt when you're growing up and it could be just rejection that you feel. It could be that your dad or mom wasn't horrible, but they worked a lot. So the enemy could have been telling you lies saying your dad doesn't love you, your mom doesn't love you, otherwise they'd spend more time with you. So we never get taught to think about the thoughts and taking them captive and what it comes down to actually thinking what thoughts are coming from the enemy. So as you grow older, what will happen is let's say that you were a girl and you were hurt from your father or your mother, then the enemy's gonna tell you, let's say if it was your father, that you can't trust your husband because he is a man, just like your father. Your father didn't protect you. He said things that weren't gonna help you. So therefore you need to make all the decisions. You can't trust him. He's gonna make bad decisions. And so it causes you to start having strife because he's trying to maybe make a decision that maybe it's not a horrible decision, but yet you're coming against it because the enemy's telling you this is a bad decision, don't trust him, da -da 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 -da, just like your father. And same thing with men. If men are growing up and they've been hurt by their dad or their mom, then the enemy's gonna speak to them, saying you can't trust your wife, your wife's not making the best decisions, blah, 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 and then you end up having children. And then the enemy starts to pick on your children through you. How, that's how most of the, the pain happens and it continues on from generation to generation. Now it could be that you had good father, good mother, and that maybe you just had a sleepover at somebody's house and somebody said something, showed you something, did something to you that was inappropriate. All it takes is one little thing from the enemy to get a, a, a stronghold into you. Um, so it's just some type of a trauma, some type of a, it could be a mild trauma, it could be a large trauma. The more pain that you go through, the stronger normally you're going to hear those voices in your head from the enemy. 
and then you 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 don't discern it. You don't you don't you you can't. A lot of times, it's like you can't turn your brain off. You can't turn your thoughts off. The chatter's there, twenty four hours a day. You're trying to go to sleep. The enemy's there. The enemy's there. So, I said, okay, Lord, this explains a lot. Then I said, so now, how do we get a person delivered? I go, because I'm not going to do this in weird ways. If somebody starts like uh, doing weird things, I go, that's not me. I'm normal Nelson, and I will not do this ministry if it's not done in normalness. And, and uh, so the Lord said, yes. He goes, this is how you do it. He said, this is how you get delivered, basically, is you have to explain to them that they have to choose to forgive, and they have to mean it with their heart, their heart and their mind. Because he said, the enemy's going to try and get them to say it maybe with their mouth, that I forgave my dad a long time ago, but yet they still have bitterness and anger inside their hearts. And that keeps coming in, you know, through thoughts. So as long as we stay in that posture of our heart, the enemy has a legal right to continue to torment us and we'll never have peace. You can't have peace when you keep getting tormented by these thoughts coming in from the enemy. So that's why it's so important that you have to choose to forgive and you have to mean it. And how do you do that? Well, the way the Lord showed me is that uh, when I do my session, when we go through the prayers tonight, is I'm gonna pray that the Lord shows you all those that hurt you and then why they hurt you. Why they did what they did to you. Like, why'd your dad do what he did? Why'd your mom? Invariably because they were hurt by their dad or their mom or by someone sexually that violated them, you know, along the way. And when you can see that, then you can have compassion and then you can forgive them and say, that really wasn't them that did it. It was the demonic spirit teaching them, talking to them like a puppet and doing it. They simply did it. So then you can choose to forgive because how can you know if you truly forgave someone? Well, that is if they were to walk in the back of this room right now and they came up to you, how would you feel? Would you want to punch them? <laughs> would you want to hit them, strangle them, kick them? Or could you give them a hug and say, I love you? Could you be like Jesus? You know, Jesus said, you know, forgive them, Father. They did not know what they did, what they were doing. Yeah, that's true. So that's what we have to get to to truly get set free and delivered from these pains from the past is we have to say, okay, I will forgive them completely, no matter what horrible things they did. Because what will happen is the Lord's anointing will increase on your life when you release that completely to him. If, if the enemy keeps bringing those thoughts up and you keep, yes, they were horrible, and it keeps reminding you and you still aren't able to forgive, then you can't get set free yet. The enemy has a legal right to continue to torment you and you won't have peace. So it may be, it, it might take you months. It may take you years completely. It's, it's up to you. You can do it tonight. You can do it instantly. I see a lot of people that get instantly delivered, which is awesome. Um, but there's some that take time. And because the second thing that can stop it is pride. Pride always comes in because what happens is the enemy, when you get hurt, it tells you you can't trust anybody. Nobody else can do it the right way. You need to do it your way and your way is always right. Everybody else is wrong. So that feeds the pride inside of us. And I'm going to read here a list of items that describe what pride looks like. Because a lot of us don't know exactly what that might look like. Because the enemy is telling us, you don't have pride. It's everybody else is the problem. And that's what, that's what a lot of times we hear in, in the enemy's uh, thoughts in our minds is everybody else's problem. Now, if they were all like you, this world would be perfect. <laughs> so here's what pride looks like. Number one, assuming you already know something when someone's teaching. And when you immediately tune someone out who starts teaching you, some, uh, you something that you may be somewhat familiar with, that is an example of pride. It is the assumption that you know everything about the subject being communicated and that this person whom you see as inferior in knowledge to you cannot teach you something new. Number two, seeing yourself as too good to perform certain tasks. You know, I, out of all people, should not be lowered to have to... Uh, clean up this room after we've had a revival here or meeting, that task should be someone else. You know, it's menial. You know, they should use my wisdom that I have for teaching and so forth. Number three, being too proud to ask for help. There's something to be said for independence, but however, there are times in life that we must all admit that something's beyond our capacity. We don't know everything. I don't know everything, you know. I know what I know about the subject because I've lived it and I've went through it, but there's a whole lot of things I don't know about that I can learn from a lot of other people. So we have to be admitting that. Number four, feeling the need to consistently teach people things. Now, if you think you can teach people everything, that you know everything, well, that's this pretty prideful statement. So 
Number five, when you talk about yourself a lot, you know, your accomplishments, your education, your title, your position, your financial status, it's all a sign of pride. Number six, thinking you're better than others who are different or less fortunate. This one's subtle because a person can appear to be humble and caring on the outside. However, in their minds, the enemy is speaking to them, they secretly think that they're better than other people who have different backgrounds, cultures, experiences than they do. So we see a lot of the racism. You know, the people think, well, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better. I'm like, really? I'm like, stop it. <laughs> Number seven, when you disregard the advice of others. This root has its this has its root in thinking that you have all the answers to life and you somehow don't need or see the value in others perspectives it carries the idea that you believe you can be successful and accomplish your goals without the counsel of others number eight when you are consistently critical how many people know critical people it's not fun being around people that criticize this is when we tend to put others down often because there is a deep-seated need for us to feel better about ourselves so basically, the enemy is telling us to put the others down because that will make you look better and feel better about yourself. So people who are critical are that way because they secretly see themselves as exempt from the very same things they criticize others for. Number nine, consistent need for attention and affirmation. When someone constantly needs to be the center of attention in public or secretly craves consistent affirmation for their accomplishments, looks, personality, serving intelligence or physique, this is a sign of pride. Number 10, when you're unable to receive constructive criticism. When a person struggles to allow other people to speak into their lives and provide helpful feedback, it's a sign of pride because they are too blinded by their own pride to see the value in what someone else is sharing with them and how it can help make them a better person. So therefore you believe you're never wrong and everyone else is. Number 11, overly obsessed with their physical appearance. Uh, they like to flaunt their figure, their physique in front of others with the hopes that people will notice and gawk at them. This is vanity, which is yet another form of pride. Number 12, unwilling to submit to authority. When a person's unwilling to submit to authority at work, church, or home, or any other relationship, it's because deep within the person, they believe they could make better decisions than the person God has placed over them. So they submit outwardly, but inwardly they struggle to accept the subordinate position they are in. Number 13, ignoring certain people's attempts to communicate with you because you don't value them. So therefore, if they can't do anything to advance you or help you to you know, elevate yourself in control and power over other people, then you can blow them off, blow off their texts, their phone calls, their emails. Number 14, when you justify your sin instead of admitting it. When someone graciously points out a sin issue in your life and you get defensive and even start to justify it, that is a dangerous place to be because if you're using scripture to support, then you are essentially saying that you know better than God. Number 15, name dropping. When you consistently associate yourself with people who have prominent positions and publicly drop it in conversations in hopes that people will think you are equally as important as those people you associate with, this is a very subtle form of pride. Number 16, you are on a different timetable than others. So therefore, you can show up late for a meeting or for a call because your time is more valuable than others. Number 17, pride causes you to get angry easily. So if anyone questions your intentions, motives, or statements, you will get angry quickly. So people have to walk around on eggshells around you. Number 18, your inner circle of people must consist of yes men or women. So they must agree with everything that you say. Because if they don't agree with you, you're gonna take an offense. And you're gonna kick them off your island. So therefore, you're gonna to to surround yourself with people that can agree with you. But unfortunately, sometimes you'll start losing friends as you get older because more and more people will not put up with that. And then as you get older, I've seen people when they get into their 50s, 60s, 70s, they have very few friends because they burnt all their bridges with everyone else. They're tired of dealing with the pride. 
Number 19, do you think of yourself as more spiritual than others in your church? Like maybe you'll say, oh, I fast 25 days every month. <laughs> And I pray in tongues 26 hours a day. Yes. What do you do? You know, so it's very prideful, very religious. And uh, number 20, do you have a touchy, sensitive spirit? You take an offense easily. You get your feelings hurt easily. Number 21, do you avoid participating in certain events for fear of being embarrassed or looking foolish because you know you won't win or look good? Number 22, do you avoid being around certain people because you feel inferior compared to them and you don't feel like you measure up? Number 23, when is the last time you said these words to a family member, friend, or coworker? I am sorry for what I did to hurt you. I was wrong. Remember Fonzie when he said that in Happy Days? He couldn't say I was wrong. <laughs> They have a hard time saying I'm wrong. You know, would you please forgive me? Number 24, do you react to rules? Do you have a hard time being told what to do? And then number 25, do you worry about what others think of you? Too concerned about your reputation. So that's what pride looks like. And of course, God's not real happy with pride. He uh, comes out against it. M multiple verses in the Bible. Um, I'll go through a couple of those. So James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Proverbs 29.23, A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. And then James 4.6, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So that's what the spirit of Leviathan primarily does is causes us a lot of uh, pride. Now I'm going to read some additional things so you can identify with this. And all this is, is kind of like a, what a doctor does. He's trying to diagnose. In fact, I was talking to I think you over there, trying to diagnose this from the symptoms, what it might be as the root cause of that pain in your life. That's kind of what the Lord's been having me do. It's kind of like a doctor is sharing these characteristics. And then you come to your own conclusion saying, I think that might have an influence in my life. And if it does, you're like, I don't want that. I'm going to take authority over that in Jesus' name and get rid of it. You know, and so in order to do this, we have to humble ourselves from the pride. We have to repent, essentially, for things that we've done. We have to be honest. And we have to choose to forgive those that have hurt us. Then we can take authority in Jesus' name, because he died on the cross, to give us that authority to use. And then we can kick out the, the spirits from us. And then what happens is, you don't have all of this chatter in your mind. You have more peace. We see a lot of healings. You think about Naaman. Naaman uh, went to Elisha because he had leprosy. He wanted to get healed. It's like he expected him to speak a word to him. But what did, what did Elisha say? He said, go down there to the filthy, dirty Jordan River where there's rats and everything. I've been to the Jordan River. <laughs> it's not clean. He's like, go down there and wash yourself seven times. And then Naaman's like, are you kidding me? I'm not doing that. He goes, what the heck? You just need to speak a word. Or if anything, if I'm going to go to a river, I'm going to go to these two clean rivers over here. And he's like, no, you go to the dirty river, the Jordan. You, you humble yourself. So he had to humble himself to get his healing. And it, it makes sense. You know, why would God heal us if we're going to be walking around with more pride and arrogancy? You know, God hates pride. He does. And I'm going to go into some verses here that even where it says he hates pride. <laughs> And it's an abomination to him. So. so anyway, some other characteristics of Leviathan. It will twist communication in our minds. So when someone's having a conversation with you, you will hear some things that maybe weren't ever said. You will confuse things. It will twist words. It will twist things. And it will cause a lot of uh, strife and fighting and arguing. And uh, the spirit of Leviathan doesn't want you to admit that you did anything wrong. So what will happen is if someone's talking to you and saying, wait a minute, you said yesterday that uh, we had, you know, $500 left in our checking account. And you're like, no, I didn't. I said we had $300 left when you actually said $500. But that Leviathan spirit is not going to have you admit that you said that. So therefore, it's going to cause a lot of strife. And, and you're going to be adamant. Uh-uh, I said $300. No, you said $500. And then how do you prove them wrong? 
you can't because they're denying it. You can't prove something that wasn't recorded. So you almost feel like you have to record most of what you are con conversing with them with because it's not lining up. Or they'll say that you said something like last week and you didn't say it. And you're like, you know you didn't say that, but they swear that you said that. And you're like, oh my gosh, here we go again. So it causes strife and fighting and arguing. You go round and round and round in circles. And we see it. We see it in the government. We see it. I'm glad you said that because I, I dealt with that for decades. Mm. Uh, and it was a constant argument. I finally got a cassette recorder. Mm -hmm. Yep. Really laid back from all that after a while because yeah. it didn't just affect me, it affected my children. Right. And many friends where she would say, I said this and I said that. Yeah. And what are you going to do? I right. Mean, it's almost like insanity. Right. It's like you have to record them, you know, these people that are under this influence at a strong level because they don't see it. Because the enemy is telling them in, in such a prideful that they don't see it, that everything that they do is right. And you're just like, oh my gosh. You get worn out, you get exhausted. So it will twist communication in a person's mind. And uh, the other thing that I've noticed is I, when I, um, back in 2015, the Lord had me start a healing room in our church. And so people would start coming in from around the Indiana area. Um, and uh, invariably they came from Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, Ohio, South Carolina, Arizona, North Carolina. And we would take them through these deliverance, like what we're gonna do tonight. And we did it in like in an hour, essentially. And uh, what I learned is that that spirit of Leviathan will usually attach itself to a person on their spine. And so what it'll do is it'll camp out on their spine and it will oftentimes twist, causing them to have a lot of back pain. And then the back pain, never, so they couldn't stay awake. So they'd be trying to read the... Start sleeping and they're like, oh my gosh, this is... I can't even read. And so a lot of times it will twist to the extent that people will have scoliosis. I had scoliosis, which is a twisted spine. I had headaches. I couldn't play basketball my seventh grade year. I had to go to the chiropractor a lot because of that. Um, I've seen fibromyalgia patients almost every time are dealing with Leviathan because it twists the nerves. I've talked to some chiropractors. I had a couple that were Christians that would refer their patients to me and then we would get them delivered and then they, wouldn't, they would get healed. And it was just a, an amazing thing. And then there's other things that you can get Leviathan from besides just like father wounds, mother wounds, stepfathers and stepmothers, any type of society or any type of a special secretive group that a person joins where they make oaths to the enemy, not to the Lord, and it's a secretive thing, that can also bring in the enemy to come on down the bloodline and hurt them as well as their children, as well as their grandchildren. You know, because the iniquities of the fathers come down to the third and the fourth generations it talks about. And that's how it happens, is if we end up choosing to do some things, making oaths to the enemy, not to the Lord, then that can open the door up legally to come on down the bloodline and torment us. And so there was a guy at our church, he was involved with Freemasons, he later became a Shriner, and he actually came out of that, and he started exposing some of the things that he had to say and go through, and it wasn't godly, it wasn't good at all. And so he had a whole bunch of pains in his bodies, as well as his, his children, and it kept coming down the bloodline. And he's like, oh my gosh, you know, so we had to really, we, we have to make sure that we, you know, break off generational stuff that can come down the bloodline that can hurt us. And it may be nothing that we did that was wrong. You know, there's things that we do that sin, obviously we're humans, um, but we need to repent for that. But if there's somebody else in our bloodline, like my grandfather was involved in Freemasons, I was innocent. I didn't do anything like that, but it came down the bloodline. I started getting scoliosis and started getting headaches. And I'm sure it came back down the bloodline from him. And I was like, I didn't know that. I didn't even know he was involved in that until after he passed away. It was several years after that. So anyways, and then Jezebel. Jezebel always comes with the spirit of Leviathan. So these are the characteristics of a person that would describe them that would have Jezebel. They're gonna have a lot of fear and anxiety because they're gonna hear the voice of the enemy pretty loudly and those traumas are gonna be brought up to them over and over again as they're growing up. So they're not gonna have much peace, you, know, you can't. I mean, it's impossible. They're gonna have a lot of anxiety and fear. And then what that looks like is you're gonna get thoughts coming in from the enemy saying, what about this, this bad thing here's gonna happen, you can't trust that person, da, 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 da. And you're just like, my thoughts can't, I can't turn my thoughts off, so you're always, going to be in a state of various levels of fear and anxiety. 
And again, you can't medicate out a demon. The demon has the legal right to keep tormenting you. It can kind of make you feel like a zombie, but it doesn't actually get to the root issue. And that's what I want to get to is the root issue so that people get delivered completely and are feeling great. So now Jezebel causes you to want your way because after all, it's telling you that your way is right and everybody else is wrong. So therefore you're going to control everybody to get your way. And you think that if you control people that they can't hurt you like you had been hurt when you were growing up. And all it does is ruin your relationships. You know, you're never gonna have a good peaceful relationship because who wants to be controlled and demanded to do whatever you want them to do? Because it's the spirit in you that's telling you to do all this stuff. It causes you to manipulate other people so that you get your way. So it's gonna cause you to say things. Could be a gentle, quiet manipulation. You know, you may just whisper something like, you know, honey, um, I think that uh, we should uh, go and uh, uh, eat at this restaurant instead of that restaurant. And maybe you're, you know that your husband or your wife really has their heart set on this other restaurant, but you get them into a guilt trip or say, you know, um, I haven't had um, my choice here in the last 12 minutes and it's really my turn to get uh, what I want. So, or they might say, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to be intimate with you tonight unless I get my way. How many times does that happen? You know, there's, there's a lot of that going on because it really wrecks the intimacy in a marriage, you know, because you have these spirits going on, causing you to say things to hurt your spouse instead of saying things that love them. Jezebel characteristics uh, also include jealousy. So it'll cause you to be jealous saying that you think you're, I remember this one guy, he, uh, he was molested by his uh, sister. She was 15, he was eight. He told nobody in the world. And he ended up getting married to a woman, beautiful woman, and for 20 years, he did not trust her. He was controlling. He would, to the point where he would call home like every day to check on her, to make sure she wasn't out with another guy. And I'm like, what? You know, uh, and, and every day, it was wearing on her. She was exhausted. She was, I, I just need to get away from him. I can't stand this. So I was describing to him uh, he came to meet me on a TV show that I was on, and I was describing about the spirits and so forth, and he's like, yep, yep, that's my wife. She's got Jezebel. And I was like, oh, no, he doesn't even see this. So I'm like, listen, I go, sometimes people get hurt sexually, and they don't ever tell anybody, and then they end up hearing those voices for their whole life, and all of a sudden, it clicked finally with him. He's like, oh my gosh, I haven't told anybody this in the world. Yeah, my sister, when she was 15 and I was eight, she did something to me sexually. And ever since then, I've heard voices telling me not to trust women, and especially my wife. And that's why I called her every day, is because I didn't trust her. Uh, wow, I have Jezebel, don't I? I'm like, yeah, probably. <laughs> and so he went through the prayers, and he actually had pain like in his chest and his arm, and it was healed instantly. And then after that, the Lord said, invite him on the TV show, interview him. I was like, what? He won't do that. You know, he was just super prideful like 10 seconds ago. You know, he's like, no, to do it, ask him. So I'm like, hey, would you be willing to be on the TV show and share your testimony? He said, yes, absolutely I would. And his wife's like, <laughs> shocked, like, oh my gosh. And he did, he shared it for the whole world. And I'm like, <gasps> and then she, she called me like a week later. I'm like, so is he calling you every day anymore? She's like, no, he trusts me. Oh my gosh, he's not hearing those voices anymore. I'm like, yes. So Jezebel will also, so again, that's why it's so important we kick out the strong men. The strong men are Jezebel, Leviathan, Ahab, Legion. You get the big ones kicked out, all these other demons go with it. So that way you've got a lot of peace going on in your mind instead of let's go after the spirit of fear, let's go after the spirit of jealousy because the, the, the uh, strong man still has a legal right there. And you'd have to go through, I don't know how many demons get rid of Jezebel. There's like 6,000 demons in Legion, so. We should just address it like Jesus did. Legion, go out to the pigs in Jesus' name, or in my name, <laughs> and boom, they did it. You know, there's 2,000 pigs. You know, Legion, 6,000 demons, that's about three per pig that uh, cause them to go into the water and drown themselves. So anyway, these other characteristics, sexual impurity and selfishness, uh, that will go away with uh, getting delivered. Lying, Jezebel's really good at lying. And they can, uh, they can bring down a church, they can bring down a ministry, they can bring down just based on whispering a lie and getting people to believe the lie. And the churches don't grow because the person is lying, lying, wanting to take over, take a, you know, authority, lying about the pastor, lying about the pastor's wife, lying about certain people. You know, I've been lied about, and it's like, it's not fun because when people believe the lies, 
It's like, they won't talk to me. <laughs> it's like, I didn't do anything. I loved her really well. <laughs> you're evil. Oh, we heard what you did. It's like, really? I'm like, you're hearing it from a person that's got a lot of demons that lies. <laughs> but of course, they don't want to, you know, if they don't discern it, you know, oftentimes the Lord will speak to a person to tell them the truth. And that's how they know and discern it. But it's really hard for the majority of the people out there. They're going to listen as truth, whoever told them whatever. And that's the problem. I feel so sad for people that are in relationships, married to people that have Jezebel because the Jezebels will lie, 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 lie. And then you believe the lies. It's like how many lies, I was, the Lord just told me this other day I was driving. He's like, Nelson, there's a lot of lies that you've even believed. Well, I'm like, I'm sure there is. I'm like, because I don't know what the truth is. You know, I'm, I'm getting much better at the discernment level and you will tonight as well. Because when this breaks off, you will be able to see it in other people. It's really hard for them to get past you because you'll be able to now hear the Lord's voice way more clearly, you know, and, and it's like the enemy's voice. I, I can discern it so quickly that it, he rarely speaks to me because he knows I can pick it up. I'm like, why would I listen to a liar tell me something? If, I, if you give a person that's a liar, say, a whole sentence to speak to you, you're going to either get angry at somebody, you're angry at yourself, you're going to get jealous, you're going to get controlling, you're going to get manipulative, you're going to get mad, take an offense. So why would you let the enemy speak a sentence to you, much less three words? And so that's what I started paying, paying attention to my thoughts every day back in like 2009, 2010. And I started taking the thoughts captive that I knew were from the enemy. I'm like, this is going to change everything. I go, if I can only hear thoughts from the Lord or myself, man, I'm going to be a different person. I'm going to walk in peace all the time because I'm not going to get into fear because fear is false evidence appearing real. And that's what the enemy does, is saying, if you do this, you better do that. Da, 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 da. Just, just hold on, okay. Yeah, it's fine. Um, and Jezebel wants you to have a desire for power and leadership. It wants to get into power and leadership, like Jezebel was. Jezebel married Ahab so that she could have the power to do what the, what the enemy, what Satan wanted her to do, and that was to shut down the true prophetic voices, kill the prophets. And so that's what she did. She started killing the prophets. She worshiped Baal. One of the pieces of Baal is sacrificing babies, sacrificing children, which ties into the whole abortion thing. That's really, you know, being... In fact, for those of you that didn't know, there's a movie called Unplanned that my very good friend Robia Scott is in. She plays the villain, Cheryl, who's like in charge of the Planned Parenthood. So she's really sweet and nice, though, in real life. In fact, I'm looking to do a conference with her, hopefully in another couple months. So, But she's very prophetic, very gifted. She has a ministry, and I've known her for 10 years um, she used to be a dancer for Prince. She used to be on Buffy the Vampire Slayer TV show before she became a Christian. But she and her husband and daughter are just awesome. But unplanned is going to I hopefully change the whole uh, abortion in, in the United States. You know, So that would be so awesome. So, um, but that's a part of Jezebel. Um, Jezebel's dominating. They intimidate. They like to threaten, just like Jezebel threatened Elijah after he called fire down and burned up, you know, the... Uh, uh, their sacrifice and then killed all the Baal prophets, she threatens him. And in one threat, he goes running into the desert, goes into a cave and says, Laura, kill me, kill me. Right. How many of us have ever dealt with Jezebels and you want to say, I just want to die. I just want to go away, you know, because it is. It's, it, it's like exhausts you. It wears you out. Uh, Jezebel will cause us to act assured of ourself, and, but yet we'll be very insecure. So it wants us to think that we know everything. You know, we know everything about everything. But inside, we know that we don't, you know, that those that struggle with Jezebel. Jezebel does not like to be told no. It will get angry. <laughs> so be prepared for that. Another thing that I've seen is that Jezebel loves to provoke people and get them angry and wear them out. And once they get angry and they stand up and they're like, ah! they're like, oh, look how evil that you are. And they point the finger back at you and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. And then they want to make you take the blame when they're the ones that did it. They're the ones that provoked. They love to provoke people. Um, and I can say that I used to struggle with Jezebel. I had more of the Ahab. We normally default to one or the other, Jezebel or Ahab as the default. But we can have all three. Most of us have all three at, the, at some level. Um, so basically, I, I, I remember getting into Christmas time and I wanted to provoke my brothers to get them angry. And I was like, yes, after I got them angry. And I was thinking... Later, I'm like, wow, I was really bad. <laughs> Why would I do that? That's not a Christ-like thing to do. But the enemy kept telling me, do it, do it, do it, do it. Um, Jezebel likes to start arguments, get everybody all upset, and then walk away. And they're just smiling like a Cheshire cat, like, ha-ha, I won. <laughs> they, um, 
Also have ch constant chatter in their mind from the enemy. It's just loud and they can hear it. I've had so many people that comment, oh my gosh, they got delivered. I don't hear the voices anymore. I'm at peace. And you can see their countenance change in their face. They smile instead of, you know, are angry or it looks sexual, you know. I got some pictures here of some people that uh, before and the after, they're just remarkable. Um, and if, if they're your boss, put it this way, if they're your boss and they have Jezebel, if you don't do exactly what they would do, they'll get mad at you. So it's really hard to please a person that has this. They're like a micromanager, because they think that they're perfect and that you are not. Uh, they can be perfectionistic. They also, I've seen this with the women more than I have the men that have Jezebel. And that is that when they grow older and they have children, they will purposefully, well, purposefully, they will purpose. Why doesn't like the peas? They will purpose. They will on purpose. How can I say this? <laughs> they will intentionally lie from sibling to sibling about each other to try to get their siblings to hate each other. I'm like, what? Why would they do that? Because it's the spirit. The spirit wants you to believe lies about your brother or sister so that you'll hate them, and they want you to draw only to them. They want to control everything. So I, I've had my best friend. His mom did that. She lives down in Florida now. And she's, he's like, yeah, we figured it out finally, like 15 years into it. All these lies, we started hating each other. We wouldn't talk to each other. And the one day we finally talked, and then we found out that our mom was lying about the whole thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I had so many people. I have a friend that lots of people I know. And they're like, why would a mom do that? I'm like, a mom that's being influenced by the Je spirit of Jezebel would do that, because it's telling them to. So... Um, and those that are considered the strongest level of Jezebel would be considered by the psychological community as narcissists, if you've ever heard of that term. Narcs, they call them. There's a lot of narcissist groups out there on Facebook, by the way. There's a lot of angry people. And see, what happens is that's the goal of the enemy is to do all these evil and bad things to their spouse and their children to get them hurt really bad, taken advantage of, so then that inflicts them with the same spirits. And that's why it goes from generation to generation to generation. That's what's wrong, really, with the world, if you think about it. We have all the Jezebels that seek after the Ahabs to marry. So what's an Ahab? And Ahab doesn't like confrontation. They want to just go along with the other person, they want to just be at peace. They have a hard time being a strong spiritual leader. They have a strong desire to make everybody happy. They're afraid of being rejected. They don't like to take responsibility. That's why they marry a Jezebel, because a Jezebel, they have no problems making all these decisions, but they're bad <laughs> decisions, and they won't take responsibility. So the Ahabs feel safe being married to someone that's going to be really dominating, that's assured of themselves. Um, it's just amazing. Ahabs uh, have a challenge making decisions, because they want to make sure that they make everything right, and if they make something wrong, they're going to get yelled at. Um, they're oftentimes very nice people, but they're too nice. They get walked over a lot very easily. So you see this in every relationship. You see a stronger personality marrying a weaker one, a Jezebel versus an Ahab, one that's a giver, the Ahab marrying the taker, which is the Jezebel. So when you get delivered from these, you have a great life because now you're not being tormented by these thoughts up there anymore. And you can laugh. You can have fun. You have the childlike innocence restored to you because now you're not hearing the voice of the enemy. You're not like being a puppet anymore for Satan saying, ha, ha, ha. I mean, the enemy is the enemy, and that's what my whole message is, is the enemy is real, and, that, and, and that's why the enemy doesn't want us to talk about this in the churches, and that's why the churches are very much of a mess, <laughs> because they won't talk about this. Let's just talk about Jesus, and let's just focus on Jesus, and then you start, okay, um, and there is no such thing as an enemy? Oh, no, Christians can't have demons. Oh, great. Then why is my spouse doing this, 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 and this? Well, why is this happening? Did, did, did. Why is my mom and my dad doing Um just pray for them and love them. What? What? You do that. You know, so it's like, and, and there, I, I get so many calls from pastors and pastors' wives describing, you know, this is, they've got this. You describe them to a T. How did you know them? I mean, because the spirit is the same in everybody. Some to more degree than others. You know, the narcissists are the very strong level Jezebels. There's some that are just minor Jezebels, and that's only because they didn't maybe get hurt as deeply. You know, like I had some of that because I didn't get hurt as deeply. My mother would have been the Jezebel. My dad would have been the Ahab. So I was more like my dad. It was hard for me to be a spiritual leader. I wanted to be. I know that that's what they preached in church. 
you man need to be the spiritual leader to your family. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, how do I do that? I don't know. So I wrote a book called Waking the Lion Within that deals with the Ahab spirit. I wrote a book called Restore to Freedom that deals with the Jezebel and Leviathan spirits and Legion. Um, Legion, I'll talk a little bit about that. Legion causes us to think about, just like Legion, the man that had Legion, he was, remember, living in the tombs and uh, he would break free from chains and stuff and he was tormented at a very deep level and um, very discouraged and so forth. So Jesus came up to him and he asked him his name, Legion, and then he's like, okay, cast out Legion in, in my name. <laughs> and, uh, and they said, send us to the pigs. So send to the pigs. What do the pigs do? They go right back to the water because a lot of the spirits that were on them are water spirits. And there's 6,000 demons because there's 6,000 in a Roman uh, army that are part of a legion. We call them legions. That's why there's 6,000. So 2,000 pigs rushed down into the water and drowned. And the guy was in his right mind instantly after that. So I've seen people that used to have bipolar instantly get delivered and all of a sudden their minds are clear and they don't have those thoughts anymore and they're like a different person you can see the before and after pictures on facebook and it's just remarkable it's like oh my gosh they're a different person because you can literally see in the eyes the eyes are the windows to a person's soul so you can see and you can't really fake that you know it's really hard to um but then like my son his personality changed just like that um i can show you his picture before and after you can probably see it a little bit from where you're at. But this is the before. You can see the eyes. Oftentimes the eyes like are black or darker when they maybe are, like they have blue eyes or green eyes. And then after he got delivered, this is like a year later. Can I do what? Yeah. Thank you. There's the after. So he was changed. And, uh, and I'll show you this. This is a couple of the women that are in my ministry before they got delivered and after. This one woman, she's, she's uh, one of my senior directors now of our Restored to Freedom team. This is a before picture. And mind you, she is kind of posing here with her lips first. But you can see the eyes and the eyebrows. And then the after, much softer, much gentler, more pure. And she took her kids through the deliverance. They were like uh, five, seven, nine, something like that. And they all got delivered. And then when they got delivered, they were getting better grades in school because they didn't have the chatter up there all the time, distracting them. And uh, her sister got delivered, her brother got delivered, their mom got delivered, their aunt got delivered. I mean, everybody's getting delivered. So now they get together for the holidays and they actually like to get together for the holidays because they don't strive and they don't fight. They don't argue anymore. I mean, that's the beauty of being freed. But you have to talk about the enemy to recognize that there is an enemy. You know, we have, I was with uh, Kel Bales yesterday and he was in the Air Force and he had to be trained on the enemy. What does the enemy look like? What are their tactics? That's what I do with Restore to Freedom. It's what I do with Waking the Line Within. It's explain. These are the tactics. This is how the enemy looks like because when i was growing up i'm like well we don't have demons in america they're all over in africa <laughs> i'm like oh no we do have they're everywhere they're in the church <laughs> you know that's where a lot of them camp out because they want to stop and hurt people and keep hurting them you know so the here's i'm going to finish this up and then we'll go through the prayers and we will be done but uh so these are some of the uh, verses proverbs 6 16 through 19. Um, and again legion legion causes us to be, be thinking about all the discouragements of our past so that we live in the tombs of the past over and over. It keeps reminding us of the past, how this bad thing happened, that bad thing happened over and over and over again. And then we're gonna talk about witchcraft curses. We're gonna break off that because there are white witches, Christian witches that are in the church today, like 1.5 million of them, and they are activated. They are basically worshiping with you. They act like they're Christians. But oftentimes you can discern there's something not right about this person. There's something not, you know, they're wanting to touch me a lot, put their hands on me more than they maybe should, and that maybe they, uh, they don't like us to put our hands on them. <laughs> you know, maybe they're very touchy, you know, and maybe they want us to listen to them for everything, all their decisions. We need to run them through them because they want to control us to that level. You know, so there's, there's white witches out there that can curse people, that can cause them pains in their bodies. 
they, they've you know, done whatever sacrifices, they've done altars to Satan and all these evil things. And they're in the church. They're considered white witches, Christian witches. There's 1.5 million of them in the United States. Wicca is another term. Um, and there's like 1.4 million Presbyterians in the church or in the United States. So there's, it's grown tremendously. There used to be like, I think it was like maybe 50,000 that were white witches like maybe 10 years ago. Now it's 1.5 million and growing because there's power in that. They do it for the power to control people. Witchcraft, of course, is bad. So <laughs> Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. So he hates pride. And that's the spirit of Jezebel. A lying tongue. That's the spirit of Jezebel. A proud look is a spirit of Leviathan. I think I said Jezebel for that. But pr proud look is Leviathan. A lying tongue is Jezebel. Hands that shed innocent blood. Remember Naboth, Naboth's vineyard. That Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. Naboth wouldn't sell it. So therefore... Jezebel got involved, lied about him, had two scandals come to a banquet, accused him of, of uh, blaspheming to God and cursing King Ahab. So they took him outside and stoned him and killed him. So Jezebel likes to shed innocent blood, likes to hurt innocent people. A heart that devises wicked plans, that's Jezebel. Feet that are swift and running to evil is Jezebel. A false witness who speaks lies, Jezebel. And one who sows discord among brethren, Jezebel. So if we have Jezebel characteristics and we have Leviathan, the Lord hates that. It's an abomination to him. And those that have gotten delivered have told me, you know what, Nelson, I really wasn't a Christian. I thought I was. I acted a good game. But no, my fruit stunk. And Jesus knows that. And when I got delivered, man, I feel completely changed. I feel peace. I feel lighter. I feel, you know, purity. I, I do things that are good now. My fruit smells good. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. But if I do make a mistake, I own up to it now. I ask for forgiveness, you know, I make it, make it right. So people that have Jezebel won't do that. You know, they just keep on going hurting people. Um, and then da, 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 da. Proverbs 7, 21 through 23, we've heard this before. And oftentimes we're like, what does this quite mean? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, which is sin. So what that means is that Lord, he knows. He looks upon the heart. He looks upon the mind. And when he looks upon that, then he knows, hmm, are you really who you say you are in front of other people, or are you not? I know it. You can, cannot fool me, but you can fool other people. Um, and then this is uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 26. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are... So again, let's think about this in, does any of these describe what we do on a regular basis? Fornication, or adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, which is witchcraft, which is controlling, speaking words to control other people to hurt them, hatred, contentions, that's causing strife, fighting, arguing, that's what Jezebel does, jealousies, that's Jezebel. Outbursts of wrath, Jezebel. Selfish ambitions, dissensions, all Jezebel. Heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, well then that kind of is pretty clear. Huh. So if I want to go to heaven, then what should it look like? Says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, which is prideful, provoking one another, envying one another. 
So that's pretty clear right there. If we're walking in these things that are Jezebelish, we're not heading to heaven. That's why they said in Proverbs, or Matthew 7, 21, 23, there's going to be many that will say to me, all I've done for you, I've cast out demons in your name, I prophesy in your name. Sorry, but you were evil behind closed doors, and I saw it. I saw your heart. Because it goes on to say, well, in Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways according to the fruit of his doings. So we can't sneak one on over on God. And you know, there's a lot of people. There's, there's a woman that was from uh, Ironton, Ohio. She was Jezebel, basically, and her husband was a pastor. And uh, he confronted her in front of their family. He, she denied and would not repent, kept the spirit, and within 30 days she died. She um, hemorrhaged from her mouth bled to death from her mouth, and she was only 32 years of age. And then there's a woman I talked to that was from New Zealand, that her sister had it, and their whole family got together to confront her. She denied it, wouldn't repent. She took two steps to walk away out of the room, and she died instantly. So the Lord's serious about this. He's like, listen, you know, I've, I've, and, and what, what it says in Revelations 2, 18 to 23, and I'll conclude with this, it says, into the, and this, again, this is, he's, um, John speaking basically to the last, you know, churches, the last seven churches of today. And um, some of them are good. Some of them are really bad. Some of them are not doing what they're supposed to do. So this one describes the church of Thyatira. It says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman, Jezebel, which could be a man, who calls herself a prophetess. And we'll see this all the time with people that do have Jezebel and Leviathan. They love the titles. They love to call themselves prophets and apostles and so forth. Why? Because it's a prideful thing. I'm not saying that everybody that's a prophet is prideful and has the spirit. Same thing with apostles. There are true ones that are out there that are godly, that are doing awesome things. But if a person has Jezebel, they want that title. They'll, always, they'll get mad at you if you don't call them that title. Like, you respect me and you bow down to me and you call me prophet or apostle. You know, that's why people say, what are you, Nelson? I'm like, oh, I'm a kid from a cornfield. <laughs> you know, that's what my title is. And like, we can't use that. I'm like, oh, come on. You know, we're supposed to. We're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to, like, you know, know where our roots are and not say that we're all this and all that, you know, so... Anyway, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, which the children are symbolic of her teachings. So that's what Jezebel wants to do, get into the church and start teaching others and raising them up to become more <coughs> Jezebelish, to hurt more people. You know, I've seen there's, there's witches out there, white witches that are teaching on Facebook. Horrible, I mean, they're, they, they, they act like they're sweet and nice, but then in their private schools that they have, um, they'll talk about how they can astral project, how they can hear and listen into your conversations, but they'll call it Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit allows me to do this. I can listen into your conversations. You know, and it's like, what? what, what? And you're like, oh, the Holy Spirit. Wow, you're really anointed then to be able to do that. And you're like, no, it's very occultish and satanic and evil. That's what they're doing. And then they're able to, like, uh, say, if you never need any prayer because you're in pain, call me and I'll help you. So they'll curse them with pain, curse them with, like, a, a nauseousness in their stomach. Headaches is often signs of, of uh, witchcraft. Um, you know, you get tired. You don't have much... Uh, back pain, neck pain, things like that, that are just out of the ordinary. And you don't know why you would have gotten that. You go to the doctor, doctor can't fix it. You know, you're just like, I don't know. Well, that can be witchcraft. And then what they'll do is get you to say, well, are you feeling sick? I'll pray for you. And then they'll stop cursing you. And then all of a sudden you get healed. And then they're like, wow, I'm gonna come to you all the time. Because they, they love that adoration that they get to be all that. And so you have to be aware of that, so. But it says here, I'll kill her children with death, which is those that she teaches. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. So that's what it comes down to, is we have the choice. We have a free will. You know, I've seen it when I prayed for kids that they will get delivered, like almost 100% of the time uh, instantly. I've seen that. 
Um, but when you become 19, 20, and you move out of your parents' home, then even your own parents, you know, if you are the parent, your own children, you don't have authority anymore. They end up taking on their own authority. Kenneth Hagin talked about this senior with his son. He said, I can't pray for you anymore, son. You have to take on your own authority now. You're of age now. And so he had to learn his own authority for himself. Well, the same thing applies is if we're praying for somebody, we can be really anointed. You know, I prayed for people and seen demons leave and so forth. Um, but it's the, the, the easiest way of getting freed is for us to humble ourselves and say, okay, I'm going to repent tonight. I'm going to mean this with my heart because, man, I don't want any of this. And maybe I think I might have some of this. Because what the enemy is trying to say to you is, before you get delivered, is like, you don't have this. This is ridiculous. This is nuts. No way. You know, it comes against this. And, you know, and some of you might have had some distractions trying to keep you from coming tonight, maybe leading up to this, too. I've seen a lot of people that, oh, my gosh, you wouldn't believe what I went through to come tonight. <laughs> so um, our heart's intent. In fact, I did a... I went out to watch this one video that said how to become a witch. And I'm like, I do not want to watch this, God. And God's like, you need to watch it. Yeah. And then what they talked about was it was the intent of the person's heart, whether or not they would be a good witch or a powerful witch or not. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's the heart. That's what it's all about, isn't it, Lord? He's like, yes. I know, and I search the hearts and the minds. And if they have a good heart and they have good intentions, you know, then I love them. But when they have the bad heart and they're doing all these evil things to hurt people, then I hate that. He, he loves us all, absolutely. He died on the cross for all of us. But he gives us free will. So he cannot, just like we cannot override someone's free will. I can't make anybody get delivered. I do the best as I can to speak the truth and then let you guys take authority in Jesus' name and then get it done. But even Jesus couldn't override everybody's free will. He couldn't go over like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the Sanhedrin. You know, their hearts were wicked. He knew it. He couldn't cast out demons from them. They had a legal right to keep them. So you have a legal right to keep the demons you enjoy playing with. But if you don't want to play with them anymore, and you, now you know the truth, now then we take seriously what we're going to do next, and that is we're going to go through the prayers. And so everyone that can stand, I'm going to have you stand. If you can't, you can be seated. And this should take about mm, 15, 20 minutes. So. Yeah. I'll wait till I'll wait till I'll wait. Yeah, we'll just do that actually. Thanks. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take authority and pray um, to shut down any type of a weird manifestation so that people are all done this in a normal way. And then we go through the prayers and you're going to repeat after me and mean it with your heart. And what you'll see is some of you might yawn because that's a common way I've seen uh, people respond to the deliverance, and some of you won't do anything. Some of you will feel a lot lighter. Some of you will have healings done tonight in your bodies that you couldn't get healed from before. Some of you may feel it come unwrapping like Leviathan from your spine. That's kind of cool, you know, because like, oh my gosh, I can feel it. It's like, and you feel lighter and you feel clearer and it's like a fog lifted off your eyes and you can see uh, colors more clearly and vibrantly. So, and then a lot of you will have good dreams tonight, prophetic dreams, and you'll be changed and you'll be smiling instead of like, you know, it's like, it's so, it's so interesting. You see, you know, like, I'm a Christian and I'm so happy. <laughs> really? I want what you've got. Not, <laughs> you know. So it's like, you know, I love doing what I'm doing because I'm like a kid uh, in a candy store, a kid in a cornfield, just driving around the United States and just having a blast, you know, helping people get set free and saving marriages and then helping new ministries launched and stuff. It's really cool. And seeing healings, I always love, you know, so I'm basically now we're doing what was prophesied, but it took a long time to get to that point. And there's a lot of you that you're ready. You want to start doing more ministry. And then the Lord's going to start to break you out tonight. And then all of a sudden you'll be like, okay, now I can discern the enemy's voice. And I'm dangerous now because I'm not going to tolerate that anymore. I'm taking authority in Jesus' name. So, so I'm going to pray first. So thank you, Heavenly Father, right now I shut down any and all manifestations from the enemy in Jesus' name. I declare that you are not allowed to do anything in Jesus' name. And now I release, Heavenly Father, the angels over us. Give us peace. Let us fill your peace. And let the Holy Spirit flow in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of Jezebel. So here we go. Say, thank you, thank you, Heavenly Father. I want nothing to do with the spirit of Jezebel. I want nothing to do with the spirit of Jezebel. So I repent for everything that I have done to hurt other people. So I repent for everything. 
and I choose to forgive my father for all that he did to hurt me. And I choose to forgive my father for what he didn't do to protect me. And I choose to forgive my mother for all that she did to hurt me. And I choose to forgive my mother for what she didn't do to protect me. Okay, now I'm going to pray and let the Lord show you all the others that have hurt you. So it could be step parents, sisters, brothers, spouses, um, past spouses, pastors, teachers, policemen, lawyers. So Holy Spirit, right now, show everyone, Lord, all those that have hurt them in their lives. Let them see them, Lord. And then let them see them as you see them, how they were also hurt by the enemy so that they can truly choose to forgive them and have no bitterness left for the enemy to stand on. Now I want you to say, I choose to forgive and then name the first names of everyone that the Holy Spirit's revealed to you. So go. Next, we're going to symbolically pull a knife out that represents all those pains from everyone that's hurt you in your life. So take one of your hands and then pull it up to your chest and then pull the knife out of your heart and then throw it down to the foot of the cross and give it to Jesus to take all your pains away and to restore all the gains that he took for us. And then I want you now to symbolically put your hand up to receive a new heart from the Lord that's never been hurt. And then put that in its place. And then say, thank you, Heavenly Father, for my new and perfect heart. That's never been hurt before. I declare that I will serve you with my new heart. All of my days remaining on earth. In Jesus, name, amen. in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I'm going to pray. I take authority in Jesus' name. I command the spirit of Jezebel to be gone in the name of Jesus. I send you to hell. I declare that you will never come back on them again. I command every demon that reports Jezebel to go with you in Jesus' name. And we just release, Heavenly Father, right now, just a spirit of purity and righteousness and holiness, Lord. Let them see themselves as you see them, that you created them, that you love them, that you are proud of them. For taking this huge step tonight, Lord. I thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. I take about 10 seconds, I take some deep breaths and relax. And start feeling maybe a little lighter, a little more peace coming in. Okay, next is the spirit of Leviathan. That's the one that wraps around the spine, causes a lot of problems physically, and um, Oftentimes people yawn more with Leviathan, it seems like, than everything else. So here we go. So thank you, Heavenly Father. You, Heavenly Father. I, want to do with pride. I want nothing to do with pride. So I ask you, Lord, to humble me tonight. Give me a humble and contrite spirit. And I also ask you to take Leviathan from me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, now I take authority. I command the spirit of Leviathan to unwrap from your spines. I command your head, the head, body, and tail of Leviathan to unwrap now in Jesus' name. And I command you to go to hell and take every demon that reports to you with you in Jesus' name. And now I speak to the damage that was done in their spines. And I command the spines to be aligned perfectly now in Jesus' name. I command every disc to pop into perfect position in Jesus' name. I command all tension and tightness from their necks and shoulders to be released in Jesus' name. Command the hips to shift into perfect position now in Jesus' name. I command any shorter leg than the other to grow out to be the same length as the longer leg in Jesus' name. 
I also command the arms to be the same length in Jesus' name. I curse all cellular memory of traumas from, from impacting you in Jesus' name. I declare that you will never have another headache ever again in Jesus' name. I declare that you will have good dreams tonight, that you will sleep soundly, that you will remember the dreams when you wake up and have the Holy Spirit give you the interpretation of those dreams. I also declare that when you read Christian books and that when you listen to messages from uh, pastors and preachers, that you'll be able to retain everything, that you will not fall asleep anymore in Jesus' name. I speak 100% health and wholeness throughout every cell in your body in Jesus' name and release right now just a humble and contrite spirit upon you that you will walk like Jesus did. He was meek, which meant he had strength, but he kept it under control. He knew who he was in Christ. So thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Now take 10 seconds and maybe move your body around a little bit just to feel if there's any feels lighter, if you feel like some of the pains now are leaving, that you have more mobility than you had before. Thank you, Lord. Okay, next is Spirit of Ahab. Ahab did more evil in the sight of the Lord than all the other kings prior, it says. What was so evil about Ahab? Well, he tolerated stuff he shouldn't from Jezebel. You know, there's, I, I had you know, stronger Ahab spirit, so I was allowing certain things to go on and happen in my relationship and in my life that I shouldn't have. I should have said, no, I'm taking a stand. And what happens is it's hard sometimes for the Ahabs to stand up to Jezebel because they know that Jezebel's going to get mad and angry and, and, and do some things that aren't pleasant or have an argument for hours and hours. So they just let things go. No, I'm not doing that anymore in my life. If I know something's not right, not with God, you know, and a, and a person's going to get mad about it, I'm going to say what God would want me to say. I'm going to be a mighty man of valor. And I want you guys to be the same mindsets, you know, that you want to be a mighty woman of valor, a mighty man of valor. And the Lord wants you to, and he'll bless that, and he'll honor that. So I'm going to get rid of Ahab so that you can do that. So say, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I want nothing to do with the spirit of Ahab. So I command you to go to hell in Jesus' name. I ask you, Lord, to give me boldness and confidence. And I will not tolerate the spirit of Jezebel, Leviathan, or any other spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I take authority and command the spirit of Ahab to be gone from you in Jesus' name. I command you to go to hell. I declare that you'll take every demon with you. And I just uh, release right now just a spirit of boldness, a spirit of confidence, a spirit of Jehu, that you will help others get set free and delivered, that you will have boldness, that you'll be a mighty man or woman of valor in Jesus' name, that you'll have more discernment than you've ever had before, that you'll be able to speak more prophetically than you've ever spoken before with specificity in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Take 10 seconds again. Take some deep breaths. Some of you are yawning, which is a good sign. You don't have to yawn, but uh, again, it's your heart's intention. I had a guy that uh, gave his testimony to me Monday. He was from Iowa. He didn't feel much at all when he went through the deliverance, but he, had, uh, he was basically a problem with alcohol. He drank alcohol a lot. He'd hear the voice of the enemy, cause him striving with his wife all the time. He went home after the session. He knew something had changed. He wasn't sure what it was, so he tested it to see if he would still be drawn to drinking alcohol. So he stopped by after work, and when he went to get a drink, he didn't like the taste anymore, and he's never drank it since. And that was back in June of last year. And it saved their marriage. They no longer fight, they no longer argue anymore, and it's amazing. Um, and they said that their children now are, are having fun. They enjoy their parents now because the parents aren't fighting, aren't striving, aren't arguing anymore. Okay, next is the spirit of legion. To so say thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Father. I don't want to live in the tombs of my past anymore. So I choose to forgive all those that have hurt me. I give them all to you. And I ask you, Lord, to take away all those traumatic events from haunting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I take authority, I command the spirit of legion to be gone in Jesus' name. I command you to take all 6,000 demons with you to hell. I declare that you will never come back on them again. And I release right now just a spirit of 
purity, righteousness, holiness, clear thinking. I declare that you have the mind of Christ in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father God, and I declare that you will no longer allow and tolerate the thoughts from the enemy anymore in your life, that you will have hope, that you will speak life, that you will look forward to the future that God has for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And again, take about 10 seconds, take some deep breaths, and then we'll finish up with the breaking off witchcraft curses. And we'll be done. Yay. A whole lot of yawning going on. Here we go. So let's say, uh, thank, you, thank you, Heavenly Father. I forgive all those that have cursed me. I ask you, Lord, to bless their souls to be healed and restored from all their traumas in their lives. I also declare that any curses spoken over me are broken off now in Jesus' name. I declare that I am blessed and that my family is blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, now I take authority and I break off all witchcraft curses over you in Jesus' name. I declare that they are null and void in the Jesus' name. I declare that you are blessed, that your family is blessed, that your children are blessed. I declare that your ministry is blessed. I speak ministry into you, that the Lord will continue to grow your ministry, whether it be personal, whether it be corporate, Lord, in Jesus' name. I declare that you will hear the uh, voice of the Lord clearly now in Jesus' name, that you will discern the thoughts from the enemy, that you will shut down the enemy's thoughts. You will not tolerate him to speak more than three words to you anymore in Jesus' name. I declare that you will walk forward today a different person. I declare 100% health and wholeness throughout every cell in your body. I declare that you can hear clearly now in Jesus' name. I declare all ears to hear clearly, to pop open now in Jesus' name. I declare that your vision be clearer than ever before in Jesus' name and that your mind be as Christ in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, and declare that you have been now restored to freedom in Christ. Amen. Yay. All righty. You can be seated. And um, before they take the offering, I'm going to real quickly go through my books. Um, So Restored to Freedom is my number one uh, bestseller by far. And this is basically written specifically to give to people that are a strong Jezebel Leviathan spirit so they can get delivered from that because it's an awkward conversation to have with anybody, especially if they're your relative. If they're your mom, their dad, you know, they won't listen to you because they're used to controlling you. So you typically have to be an Ahab around a family member that is a Jezebel that's like an adult. Um, so oftentimes that's what happens is you become an Ahab around them and then as soon as you leave, you become the Jezebel that they were. That's how the spirits work. So this is written specifically to give to people to get them delivered. And then Waking the Lion Within gets people delivered from the Ahab spirit so they can be bold and confident as what they're supposed to be, mighty men or women of valor. Keep your peace on, limiting strife in your life. Who doesn't want to have peace 24 hours a day? That's what I've been walking in now for like the last couple of years. And it's great, you know, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. I've gone through some tough stuff, but I had, it was a pro process of learning not to look upon the circumstances, not to get angry, not to get into fear, not to get into worry, but to say, listen, this is just a temporary circumstance. And, and then to recognize when the enemy is speaking to you so that you can shut down the voice of the enemy because the enemy is gonna try and whisper to you. And when you can quickly recognize, wait a minute, that's the enemy. I'm not gonna to listen to that anymore. I'm gonna shut it down. Then redirect your mind on something that is true, noble, just, good. And so that's what this is written for. So people can walk in peace all the time. And it is possible. And it doesn't matter if you have a lot of money. I've worked with one gentleman that is worth a half a billion dollars and he did not have peace. And then I took him through the deliverance and then now he can discern, oh, the enemy's trying to tell me this. The enemy's trying to tell me that. So he can shut it down. He can walk in peace now. Uh, for the single people, choosing a godly mate helps you to discern which people are healthy to get married to and which aren't. 
what signs to look for. And make sure you're delivered, because if you're not delivered from Ahab, you're gonna draw into a Jezebel relationship. That's why so many people, when they go through a divorce, they get drawn back into the very same type of person again, because that spirit seeks them out. If you are an Ahab, it's gonna search for a Jezebel, or Jezebel's gonna come after you, because like, I can control you, I know that, I know that's you. Pure and spotless, are you ready for Christ's return? Talks about what it really means to be a true Christian not a fake Christian, because there's a lot of fake Christians out there that hurt people, and it's not good. God doesn't like that. He's in the process of purifying his church, so this is a great book to give to people. Loving Like Christ, How to Love the Hard to Love People. This is my last <laughs> book before I get more books when I go to Gillette, Wyoming. Uh, by the way, there's like a blizzard coming, and I think you already know that, but I'm supposed to drive like through the blizzard to get to Gillette, so it'll be interesting to see how I get there by Friday night at 7 p.m., so... But this is a book that is for people that are in a relationship with someone that's really hard to love. Um, and it was really not fun to go through what I went through, but I was able to write the book because now I know that there are times the Lord does have you stay in relationships so that's really hard. And, uh, and at some point in time, the Lord may say it's, it's time to move on because people have free wills. You know, I've talked to a lot of people that you know, I always say, you know, get delivered, not divorced. If people were all get delivered, there wouldn't need to be divorce because you wouldn't be striving, fighting, and arguing. We'd love each other, but we all have free wills. So the goal of Jezebel is to keep you in that relationship so they can keep control of you, to shut you down and stop you from doing ministry. You know, I had to separate. If I didn't separate, I would never be doing what I'm doing because the spirit in my wife would have stopped me. I could never have done this. I wanted her to get set free and delivered so she could join me, but she refused. So I had to move on with what God's calling was. So there's a lot of us that have God's calling in our life, but we can never get it fulfilled because the person we're married to has these spirits and they're trying to stop us from doing it. It's kind of like a slow death. I've seen some people die because they've stayed in these toxic relationships because the spirit in them went to kill us gently, slowly, you know, until we finally give up and say, I just want to die. There's a lot of people just like Elijah said, I just want to die when Jezebel's on you and threatens you all day long. So all night long. Keep your faith on, changing your life from ordinary to extraordinary. There's a lot of examples here about when your circumstances look like there's nothing that's going to possibly be good to come out of this. You know, I was prophesied to have this worldwide ministry, but everything looked horrible, you know, for six years. And it's just like, and then even after I separated, um, my, my wife actually went through and filed for divorce because the pastor encouraged her to divorce me because he had Jezebel. I've noticed this. Jezebels love to team up with other Jezebels and they all get together. While well, his church was shut down by the Lord, went from 200 people to 20 and was then sold. The Lord gave me a dream and then, and then the Lord actually had me confront the pastor, even though I don't like to confront, but uh, I did. And he mocked me, was prideful. And within a year, the church was shut down. So it's, uh, it's important not to look upon the circumstances because anyone wants to keep you focused on negative circumstances and you need to speak life. You need to make sure you get delivered so you can hear the Lord's voice clearly. And then keep standing until you see the things manifest. Like my daughter, I wanted her full time in custody because my first wife had the subtle version of Jezebel. So what did I do? Um, everything looked like I was going to have to have shared custody. And she kept getting hurt whenever she went over to her mom's. And uh, I was like, oh, why can't her mom just be good? Why can't she get freed? You know, I didn't know what it was she had. And the Lord just said, just trust me and thank me every day that you have full custody of her. I'm like, she'll never do that. She'll never. And I didn't want to go to court and do it. So the Lord just said, watch what I do. Thank me. So I thanked the Lord, like for four straight months, every morning. And finally, like on the fourth month, she gave her to me full time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't think that would ever happen, you know, because <laughs> it looked crazy in the, in, the, in, in the spiritual. And there's a lot of relationships where people have gone through divorces and they have a spouse that has Jezebel that's hurting their children. And it's an awful situation. Because a lot of times you, you get guilted into saying, well, they should have time with their dad or with their mom. I'm like, yeah, but if they've got Jezebel, they're going to get hurt and they're going to get lied to about and they're going to hurt my relationship with my own child. I know what that's like. I've gone through that. Ultimately, the children normally get old enough and they get older and they can figure it out for themselves. But it is not fun going through that. So, Jesus loves to heal through you. I have learned about walking in my authority and... Uh, I have now gone through healings by praying and taking authority of everything for the last 10 years. And I dropped my health insurance in 2012, which I would have freaked out you know, back in 2008 if I would have done that. So anyway, um, and then lastly, the School of Ministry book, this is a guide if you wanna help others get delivered. This is a guide that I uh, wrote to help you walk another person through getting delivered. 
And if you want to be certified under Restore to Freedom, I've got 100 people in nine countries now that have been certified, then you just simply need to, there's four hours of videos on YouTube that you need to watch, which you can go out to my website, restoredtofreedom.com, and you can click on the link to those videos. And then you need to read this book, School of Ministry, and Waking the Lion Within, which describes Ahab, and Restore to Freedom. So basically $25 for these books, because they're all $10, this is five. Um, and then if you want to be added to my website, you can do that for a donation. And then you can basically start to minister to people. So we have a lot of people that have never done ministry before that are now starting to do ministry. And they're seeing the same success that I had seen in my ministry. Lots of people all over the world are getting delivered now. And that's awesome, because they're saving their marriages and they're saving, getting healed from things and stuff. So. All right, I will turn things over, I guess, to you, and uh, I'll be over here at the end for anyone. That, you can get seven of these books for $60, and I can take credit cards if you want to. So, thank you. I am uh, going to go over.